Thank you very much, uh, Mindy Kleinberg from September 11th Advocates. My name is Mindy Kleinberg. My husband, Alan, 39 years old, was killed in the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. As I testify here today about the 9-11 attacks, I will begin by saying that my thoughts are very much with the men and women who are involved in armed conflict overseas and their families who wait patiently for them to return. This war is being fought on two fronts, overseas as well as here on our shores. This means that we are all soldiers in this fight against terrorism. As the threat of terrorism mounts here in the United States, the need to address the failures of September 11th is more important than ever. It is an essential part of lessons learned. As such, this commission has an extremely important task before it. I am here today to ask you, the commissioners, to help us understand how this could have happened help us understand where the breakdown was in our nation's defense capabilities, where we were on the morning of September 11th. On the morning of September 11th, my three-year-old son Sam and I walked Jacob 10 and Lauren 7 to the bus stop at about 8.40 a.m. It was the fourth day of a new school year and you could still feel everyone's excitement. It was such a beautiful day that Sam and I literally skipped home oblivious to what was happening in New York. At around 8.55, I was confirming play date plans for Sam when a friend said, I can't believe what I'm watching on TV. A plane has just hit the World Trade Center. For some reason, it didn't register with me. Until a few minutes later, I asked her calmly, what building did you say? Oh, that's Alan's building. I have to call you back. There was no answer when I tried to reach him at the office. By now, my house started filling with people, his mother, my parents, our sisters and friends. The seriousness of the situation was beginning to register. We spent the rest of the day calling hospitals and the Red Cross and any place else we could think of to see if we could find him. I'll never forget thinking all day long, how am I going to tell Jacob and Lauren that their father was missing? They came home to a house filled with people, but no daddy. How were they going to be able to wait calmly for his return? What if he was really hurt? This was their hero, their king, their best friend, their father. The thoughts of that day replay over and over in our heads, always wishing for a different outcome. We are trying to learn to live with the pain. We will never forget where we were or how we felt on September 11th. But where was our government, its agencies and institutions prior to and on the morning of September 11th? The theory of luck. With regard to the 9-11 attacks, it has been said that the intelligence agencies have to be right 100% of the time and the terrorists only have to get lucky once. This explanation for the devastating attacks of September 11th, simple on its face, is wrong in its value because the 9-11 terrorists were not just lucky once. They were lucky over and over again. Allow me to illustrate. The SEC. The terrorist lucky streak began the week before September 11th with the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC. The SEC, in concert with the United States intelligence agencies, has sophisticated software programs that are used in real time to watch both domestic and overseas markets to seek out trends that may indicate a present or future crime. In the week prior to September 11th, both the SEC and U.S. intelligence agencies ignored one major stock market indicator one that could have yielded valuable information with regard to the September 11th attacks. On the Chicago Board Options Exchange during the week before September 11th, put options were purchased on American and United Airlines, the two airlines involved in the attacks. The investors who placed these orders were gambling that in the short term, the stock prices of both airlines would plummet. Never before on the Chicago Exchange were such large amounts of United and American Airline options traded. 
These investors netted a profit of several million dollars after the September 11th attacks. Interestingly, the names of the investors remain undisclosed and the millions remain unclaimed in the Chicago exchange account. Why were these aberrant trades not discovered prior to 9-11? Who were the individuals who placed these trades? Have they been investigated? Who was responsible for monitoring these activities? Have those individuals been held responsible for their inaction? The INS. Prior to 9-11, our United States intelligence agencies should have stopped the 19 terrorists from entering this country for intelligence reasons alone. However, their failure to do so in 19 instances does not negate the luck involved for the terrorists when it comes to their visa applications and our Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS. With regard to the INS, the terrorists got lucky 15 individual times because 15 of the 19 hijackers' visas should have been unquestionably denied. Most of the 19 hijackers were young, unmarried, unemployed males. They were, in short, the classic overstay candidates. A seasoned former consular officer stated in National Review magazine, single, idle, young adults with no specific destination in the United States rarely get visas absent compelling circumstances. Yet, these 19 young, single, unemployed, classic overstay candidates still receive their visas. I am holding in the hand some of the applications of the terrorists who killed my husband. All of these forms are incomplete and incorrect. Some of the terrorists listed their means of support as simply student, failing to then list the name and address of any school or institution. Others, when asked about their means of support for their stay in the United States, wrote myself and provided no further documentation. Some of the terrorists listed their destination as simply hotel or California, or New York. One even listed his destination as no. Had the INS or the State Department followed the law, at least 15 of the hijackers would have been denied visas and would not have been in the United States on September 11, 2001. Help us to understand how something as simple as reviewing forms for completeness could have been missed at least 15 times. How many more lucky terrorists gained unfettered access into this country? With no one being held accountable, how do we know that this still isn't happening? On the morning of September 11th, the terrorist luck commenced with airline and airport security. When the 19 hijackers went to purchase their tickets and to receive their boarding passes, nine were singled out and questioned through a screening process. Luckily for those nine terrorists, they passed the screening process and were allowed to continue on with their mission. But the terrorist luck did not end at the ticket counter. It accompanied them through airport security as well. Because how else would the hijackers get specifically contraband items such as box cutters, pepper spray, or according to one FAA executive summary, a gun on those planes? Finally, sadly for us, years of GAO recommendations to secure cockpit doors were ignored, making it all too easy for the hijackers to gain access to the flight controls and carry out their suicide missions. The FAA and NORAD. Prior to 9-11, FAA and Department of Defense manuals gave clear, comprehensive instructions on how to handle everything from minor emergencies to full-blown hijackings. These protocols were in place and were practiced regularly for a good reason. With heavily trafficked airspace, airliners without radio and transponder contact are collisions waiting to happen. 
These protocols dictate that in the event of an emergency, the FAA is to notify NORAD. Once that notification takes place, it is then the responsibility of NORAD to scramble fighter jets to intercept the errant plane. It is a matter of routine procedure for fighter jets to intercept commercial airliners in order to regain contact with the pilot. In fact, between June 2000 and September 2001, fighter jets were scrambled 67 times. If that weren't enough protection, on September 11th, NEEDS, or the Northeast Air Defense System of NORAD, was several days into a semi-annual exercise known as Vigilant Guardian. This meant that our Northeast Air Defense System was fully staffed. In short, key officers were manning the Operation Battle Center, fighter jets were cocked, loaded, and carrying extra gas on board. Lucky for the terrorists, none of that mattered on September 11th. Let me use Flight 11 as an example. American Airline Flight 11 departed Boston Logan Airport at 7.45 a.m. The last routine communication between ground control and the plane occurred at 8.13 a.m. Between 8.13 and 8.20, Flight 11 became unresponsive to ground control. Additionally, radar indicated that the plane had deviated from its assigned path of flight. Soon thereafter, transponder conduct contact was lost. Two Flight 11 airline attendants had separately called American Airlines reporting a hijacking, the presence of weapons, and the inflictions of injuries on passengers and crew. At this point, it would seem abundantly clear that Flight 11 was an emergency. And yet, according to NORAD's official timeline, NORAD was not contacted until 20 minutes later at 8.40 a.m. Tragically, the fighter jets were not deployed until 8.52 a.m., a full 32 minutes after <coughs> loss of contact with Flight 11. Why was there a delay in the FAA notifying NORAD? Why was there a delay in NORAD scrambling fighter jets? How is this possible when NEEDS was fully staffed with planes at the ready monitoring our airspace. Flight 175, 77, and 93 all had the same repeat pattern of delays in notification and delays in scrambling fighter jets. Delays that are unimaginable considering a plane had, by this time, already hit the World Trade Center. Even more baffling for us is the fact that fighter jets were not scrambled from the closest Air Force bases. For example, for the flight that hit the Pentagon, the jets were scrambled from Langley Air Force in Hampton, Virginia, rather than Andrews Air Force Base right outside DC. As a result, Washington skies remain wholly unprotected on the morning of September 11th. At 9.41 a.m., one hour and 21 minutes after the first plane was hijacked confirmed by NORAD, Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. The fighter jets were still miles away. Why? So the hijackers' luck had continued. On September 11th, both the FAA and NORAD deviated from standard emergency operating procedures. Who were the people that delayed the notification? Have they been questioned? In addition, the interceptor planes, or fighter jets, did not fly at their maximum speed. <coughs> Had the belatedly scrambled fighter jets flown at their maximum speed of engagement, they would have reached New York City and the Pentagon within moments of their deployment, intercept the hijacked airliners before they could have hit their targets, and undoubtedly saved lives. The leadership. The acting Joint Chief of Staff on September 11th was General Richard B. Myers. On the morning of September 11th, he was having a routine meeting the acting Joint Chief of Staff stated that he saw a TV report about a plane hitting the World Trade Center, but thought it was a small plane or something like that. So he went ahead with this meeting. Meanwhile, the second World Trade Center was hit by another jet. Nobody informed us of that, Meyer said. By the time he came out of his meeting, the Pentagon had been hit. Whose responsibility was it to relay this emergency to the Joint Chief of Staff? 
Have they been held accountable for this error? Surely this represents a breakdown in protocol. The Secretary of Defense was at his desk doing per paperwork when Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. As reported, Secretary Rumsfeld felt the building shake, went outside, saw the damage, and started helping the injured onto stretchers. After aiding the victims, the Secretary then went to the war room. How is it possible that the National <coughs> Military Command Center, located in the Pentagon and in contact with law enforcement and air traffic controllers from 8.46 a.m., did not communicate to the Secretary of Defense also at the Pentagon about the other hijacked planes, especially the one headed to Washington. How is it that the Secretary of Defense could have remained at his desk until the crash? Whose responsibility is it to relay emergency situations to him? At 6.15 a.m. on the morning of September 11th, my husband, Alan, left for work. He drove into New York City and was at his desk working at his NASDAQ security trading position with Cantor Fitzgerald in Tower One of the World Trade Center by 7.30 a.m. In contrast, on that morning, President Bush was scheduled to read to elementary school children. Before the president walked into the classroom, NORAD had sufficient information that the plane that hit the World Trade Center was hijacked. At that time, they also had knowledge that two other commercial airliners in the air were also hijacked. It would seem that a national emergency was in progress. Yet the president was allowed to enter a classroom full of young children and listen to students read. Why didn't the Secret Service inform him of this national emergency? When is the president supposed to be notified of everything the agencies know? Why was the president permitted by the Secret Service to remain in the Sarasota Elementary School? Was this Secret Service protocol? In the case of a national emergency, seconds of indecision could cost thousands of lives. And it is precisely for that reason that our government has a whole network of adjuncts and advisors to ensure that these top officials are among the first to be informed and not the last. Why were these individuals where were these individuals who did not properly inform these top officials? Where was the breakdown in communication? Was it luck? Is it luck that aberrant stock trades were not monitored? Is it luck when 15 of visas are awarded based on incomplete forms? Is it luck when airline security screeners allow hijackers to board planes with box cutters and pepper spray? Is it luck when emergency FAA and NORAD protocols are not followed? Is it luck when a national emergency is not reported to top government officials on a timely basis? To me, luck is something that happens once. When you have this repeated pattern of broken protocols, broken laws, broken communication, one cannot still call it luck. If at some point, we don't look to hold the individuals accountable for not doing their jobs properly, then how can we ever expect for terrorists to not get lucky again? And And that is why I'm here with all of you today, because we must find the answers as to what happened that day so as to ensure that another September 11th can never happen again. Commissioners, I implore you to answer our questions. You are the generals in the terrorism fight on our shores. In answering our questions, you have the ability to make this nation a safer place and in turn, minimize the damage if there is another terrorist attack. And if there is another attack, the next time, our systems will be in place and working and luck will not be an issue. Thank you.